We were approached some time ago by one of ESF member organizations, Centre National de Recherche Scientifique from France, uh, that they think that the issue of relations between science and society is a one on which ESF should publish a position. Now, there is so much, that so much has been said on the topic, uh, both uh, on national and on European level, that we were a little bit concerned how we can uh, say something new. What is the sense of taking up the topic? It took us a long time, I think about two or three years, to discuss how to do it. Uh, in the meantime, our member organizations got together into something called Member Organization Forum on Science in Society Issues and produced a report from the point of view of practitioners, funders of research, how should they uh, improve their action in this area. But then we realized that we can contribute only asking researchers to look at the issue from their point of view. What to, to, to reflect on what uh, we need to know to tackle the issue better, because the feeling is that a lot has been done in Europe on this, but we are still not happy with uh, the results. So why, if we are doing so much, we are not uh, successful? And uh, I will uh, end here. I would like first to ask uh, Uri Kefeld, Professor of Science and Technology, Technology Studies at the University of Vienna, and the chair of the activity, the, the whole activity and other authors you have, uh, they are described in the report. Here you have all names. Uh, I would like to ask Ulrike to introduce uh, the uh, report and then I'll ask uh, Helga and Paul to comment uh, on, on this. So is that okay, you hear me good? Okay, great. So. My, you're courageous. You have all my esteem to be sitting here on the second day after six o'clock. And I hope I can promise that you will get drinks and food. And this is the motivational part of my introduction. So um, let me, I, I will just take a couple of minutes and, and guide you through and give you some kind of ideas. What is the life behind the report and how do we understand this report? So it's called Science in Society, Caring for Our Futures in Turbulent Times. And as many social science works, it's not an individual work, and in this sense, an, an explicit group work. We were seven of us, of which four of us are here. Teresa is here, and Pierre Benoit Joly is here, and uh, Daniel Barben is here. Thanks, Daniel, for helping my Alzheimer brain, uh, early academic Alzheimer brain. Um, and so it was a collective endeavor. There were three workshops where we discussed with a lot of people we brought in and trying to understand what are the kind of concerns, etc. And actually, there was a big concern in the beginning. I mean, there has been so much said about science in society. There were all kinds of action having been happening already. What to say beyond that? And actually, the title, as I will try to argue, the caring and the turbulence, is something that kind of brought us to think about it differently, maybe, than has been done so far. So let me run you through that. Actually, we were sitting together and we thinking at a specific particular moment in time, not that crisis or austerity has not been around several times already, but it is this idea of turbulence, which is an important one, namely, it, we are in a, in a status of full of commotion and re restlessness and quick change, and we are looking forward to do that, and that's a very important moment. And do the things we have been thinking about in science and society actually be, are they adapted to this kind of situation of change? Or are they problem solution packages where we think, okay, there's a little problem, we repair it, and that's it. So this, the second is, we are confronted in Europe with a multi-sided governance effects on science and society, which includes that we have different levels of actors, different kinds of actors, and different value systems as play out. And I think any, any process needs to answer to this kind of uh, complexity that is, is at stake here. Now, after long discussions, we identified three major areas of tension that are around, and that we label them reorderings of science and society relations, where we particularly pinpoint, and I can only pick out a couple of points, like 
the, the strong idea of governance by management and control, and the control idea is something very, very strongly present. And this idea that future has become instrumentally imagined in the sense of something to be attained and that in the present you have to behave and to comply in particular ways in order to attain this future. This was, through the two days, omnipresent as a theme. And then, of course, we were very much into this idea of diversity of actors and values, and we speak of a Europe of mobility and all that. So with people, values and orders and imaginations travel. And how can we live with these kinds of new modes of living? And how do the many implicit maps of Europe and the world look like when we think about science and society relations? So that was one major tension. The second was that we are confronted with changing conditions for research and innovation. There is definitely a tension visible between society valuing science as a public good and often quite narrow evaluation and indicator-driven evaluation systems. So how do we bring values and evaluations together again, or at least closer to each other? And so in, in that sense, also, we could say that responsibility has been downscaled to accountability. So to formalize procedures of rendering accounts and not to a much more complex idea of relationships which carry a sort of and here comes the caring idea in, which, which build relationships that are of a different kind. And finally, we have a long history of science and society activities in Europe, at least in the last two through to three deca decades. And we were looking into what were the expectations and the pretensions and what were the realities of them. And in particular, we were concerned about the fact that we observe something we call the ritualization so you add on to everything, some communication, some dissemination, some, some, without kind of considering what for, to whom, with what kind of effect we want to, to produce. And this very deep con concern of control, control in that sense over a public that might be unreasonable, and I put that under apostrophes, to refuse certain technological innovations which we have put a lot of money in. And that was the kind of GMO was just one of the cases where policymakers were quite upset about the fact having invested so much and people just don't want to kind of engage with that. Now, um, what was important to us that in many of these activities it's very unclear what science and society actually mean and we, we, we developed a kind of heuristic to think about that and we said actually we have to speak of something we call big science and big and small science and big society and small society and that spans a kind of field of thinking and let me explain what that means big science is understanding science as a corpus of objective knowledge objective more or less how you ever think about it, an institution with clear boundaries, and so everything is kind of well settled towards a science that is a practice deeply intertwined with society and with diverse valuation regimes at work. And the same you would find at the society end, we can imagine society as something, the people, the public, whatever, and we construct them through Eurobarometer research and divide them into people who know and who don't know, and in ages and south and north, Etc. Or we can think about society as something which is multiple in Europe, which is context specific, and which is to be thought in specific situated constellations. And then when you look at the activities, you will see that the current focus has been very much on classical communication and dissemination activities, not saying that there have not been many others. I'm saying the focus. A lot of money has gone into classical communication, convincing people that this is the right choice to take. And we thought what should be happening is actually a shift and more attention should be given to activities with process orientation and direct engagement in the sense, and this is not just public engagement exercises, engagement in a sense from the lab up to other settings. So it's not only, only kind of classical formats. Now, let me give you the recommendations. And from the recommendations, when you read them, uh, these recommendations will not be making policymakers extremely happy. Why not? We are not saying them there's rule one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And when you have done it, you're a good policymaker. But we say, given the fact that there are, is a multiplicity of problem constellations, given the complexities and given the dynamic nature, we need to have a process-oriented think, thinking. And we cannot come with 
a good practice that spreads then all over Europe and everybody does the good practice, which has worked maybe in one country and in one situation, but which doesn't work and doesn't fit into other political contexts. And so we, we carved out five kinds of recommendations. The first is linking excellence to relevance and responsibility. And I think this was guided by the fact that we push so much this idea of excellence, which I am quite sympathetic with on the one hand, but if this carves out a space which does not need to have a kind of conversion, a conversation with society, then this is problematic. But in order to be able to have that, we need to reappropriate the notion of relevance. Relevance not being economic relevance only, but relevance having many more facets that would also fit to the idea of open research and innovation. And that's one point. The other point would be integrating science and society issues into the programs, not only in the sense of, as I said, as an add-on, what you do at the end of the project, you have somebody coming in and, and turning that into something you can sell to larger audiences, but to really, along the processes, kind of engage with the scientists in their work, etc. And I must say, I personally have very good experiences in doing that and, and getting out a lot on both sides from, from these kinds of things. The second point is, what about science and society activities? And this comes back to this embedding and not embedding and being embedded and getting embedded and whatever. It's, do we need integrated as, as, as science in society or do we need a separation? And I think we need both. In the sense that many topics in science and society run across specific concerns and problems to be solved. And today I thought when I wandered across and listened to the reports, many of the things came up in different places. So I think social science concerns need to run vertically and horizontally in many ways. And this is really important. We need to definitely av avoid any kind of rit ritualization trap. So you get the 5% and you do some communication, brochures, web pages or whatever. And we need to reflect science society issues in the setup and the pursuit of programs and projects. The third point was, is about plurality. And plurality is not only the fact that Europe has diversity in histories, values, and ways of imagining societal futures. It's also a plurality in the way science in society issues are addressed. And we pleaded for a, a broadening of the notion of innovation. And valuing innovation not only along a, a specific kind, a, a pre-given set of categories, but to think innovation much more in a dynamic sense, and therefore not being able maybe to, be, to judge that immediately at the end of the project. How much money did I get of return? And just a little anecdote, I remember in the Einstein year, the German Minister of, of, for Science and, Science and Education, I can't remember the exact name, she very much kind of highlighted how important people like Einstein were, and he was such a wonderful mind. And now we have uh, ZD players because of him, and we have uh, um, electronic photo uh, devices, etc. And I was thinking like, the question is like, how long are the delays and the ideas about what is value? in these things, and I think we have to bring in different temporalities in thinking about plurality and, and, and values. The fourth is, we have new space, we need new spaces for science and society interaction, so it's not about confining that in a set of, set of very well entrenched things. We have to have the courage and to develop the courage to abandon the idea of controlling these relationships. So saying it is a good relationship if people, when they come out, like this kind of science or that kind of technology. This cannot be the end of such a process. And we have to put more attention to the spaces organized bottom up by people when they deal with technologies and in the practice and to better understand how technologies get into a society, change a society and get changed by the society. And finally, we need to reflect on the implicit maps. So we very much discussed about the fact who are the leaders and followers in this science society business. And when I just look from an academic point of view, you have a handful of countries who seem to be the ones that have invented science in society and the others are constructed as deficient and having to imitate. And I think this is a completely wrong way of understanding difference. And so you can learn from each other. This is not an imitation game. That's something else. And finally, five, making time space for reflexive work within science. 
Research has become so much tightly organized uh, that we need to, to explicitly carve out spaces where valuing and evaluating can go together. We need to develop incentive structures where SIS is not just a pleasure that you can do in your free time. And we have to transform science and, and our understanding of science and society activities into an inspirational space where other kinds of innovations can emerge. And in early 20th century, you have a number of scientists who have very much reflected on the fact that doing this kind of engagement things is very important for them to develop their own understanding of where they are, why they do that, and, and, and how they could connect with wider issues. Now, summing up, putting together this idea of change and turbulence and, and, uh, and putting it together with a commitment to diversity, to acknowledging difference, we came up with this kind of basic line that runs through the report that what we need to develop is a logic of care. A logic of care instead of a logic of choice and control. And that means to consider the context, to, to, to get into a process orientation and to consider the contextuality, the complexity, and the continuous development of science society issues. So this is hopefully not the last report. And it's hopefully only a starting point because we think it should be the kind of nucleus for starting debates in different directions and for developing adapted solutions in different places, in different fields, in different constellations. So this is my formal thanks. Go to all my colleagues who have allowed me to speak in their name, and <laughs> which is always a bit dangerous. And my special thanks also go to Diego, who has accompanied and cared for us to, and catered us through all the kind of ups and downs these kinds of projects have. Thank you. Thank you very much. As Ulrike said, this is for us a beginning of a process. We consider the report uh, as something which should start both discussions but also certain actions. And it is addressed, as it is clear, to uh, uh, researchers and also to research policy uh, makers. And that's why we asked uh, uh, Helga Novotnes, president of ERC and science and technology uh, professor, uh, and uh, Paul Boyle, uh, president of Science Europe and chief executive of the Economic and Social uh, Research uh, Council of the UK, uh, to comment how they see from their perspective and their organization's perspective the usefulness and the future of action in this area. So thank you for inviting me back. And I would like to focus my remarks in two, on two points. The first one concerns the timing of the report. And the second, I want to take up the challenge, uh, excellence versus relevance. And I will do this with the experience of the ERC as a background, but try to reflect on it in an SDS mode. Now, the timing, <clears throat> I think, indeed, is crucial. And it is crucial because among the many trends and turbulence, as Ulrike mentions, I see one that uh, is sort of without any interruption, an ongoing trend. And this was started with the new public management. And it is taking over the whole research enterprise in a way that was not foreseen and predicted by anyone. And what I mean is the growing reliance and the growing presence of all kinds of indicators, numbers, whatever you can measure is being measured. And it is being measured in performance indicators and other forms of indicators. And from an SDS perspective, we know that these figures even if you know how they were constructed and all the figures and indicators are constructed, uh, they take on a life of their own and in the jargon of STS, they are uh, an example of performativity. In other words, they have a power on their own in making people's behave the way how they are supposed to behave and adjust their behavior to that. And this is a trend that I find worrisome, and we can discuss this later on, 
But I think one of the consequences that I can observe best is that I think this kind of trend changes the notion of quality. And the notion of quality is essential to any kind of research, be it to the researcher, him or herself, be it to those who evaluate research, be it to those who fund research on the basis of evaluation, be it uh, to those who decide on the recruitment, promotion careers of researchers. And so this is my personal take on a worry, observing what I see happening in many countries, in many institutions, and I see no end of it as it, uh, as it is. And of course, there are many reasons that one can go into it. And of course, for an administrator, for a policymaker, to have an indicator uh, makes life easier. It's uh, a reduction of complexity. This is what indicators are here for. And they allow you to make uh, judgments on the basis of numbers alone. And if I say um, I see the notion of quality being changed, this has to do with the reduction of the place that judgment plays in whatever we do in research. And I think judgment is part, you cannot speak about quality without judgment. And if we eliminate or replace or substitute judgment with more and more of these constructs, I think we, we change the notion of quality. So this is one part of the timing. And that's the, my underlining uh, sort of response to, to, to the report. The other timing has to do with the transition to Horizon 2020. Um, and here the issues at stake are what will happen to you know, science and society within Horizon 2020. Will science-society um, relations become a proxy uh, in the sense that now, you know, the social sciences are stepping in for the society as the imagined entity that you can never get a, a, a grip on? Um, or will it lead uh, towards changes in the kind of engagement with society? Will it lead to a diminution of science and society relations, uh, etc.? And in this respect, I found what you write on page 21, where you speak about the explicit science in society issues. I found this very important, and again, drawing attention to what you call the re-timing. In other words, you know, the other part of the trend I was describing has to do with the relentless time pressure. We see it among the younger researchers. They are under tremendous pressure to uh, do whatever they do under the aspect, does it further my career? And career has something to do with being faster and faster and being more efficient and more efficient. And uh, the effect on, our, on the younger generation of researchers, if we are not taking this time component into consideration and somehow create what in the report is called for, you know, release the pressure, create time and uh, create time space. Um, and uh, then this, this is certainly, uh, in, in my view, a very important part. And then, of course, um, the risk of um, becoming uh, squeezed in or squeezed out, uh, you know, in, in the sense of fun activities. Science is fun, and we know many examples that this is a way how scientists approach or how their public relations people, who large institutions employ now to do that, um, it's a way of getting into um, the, you know, be it uh, science festivals, be it schools, whatever. And science is fun, is fun, but it only gets you so far. And then especially with children comes the part when you say, well, just by looking at a mathematical game, you know, it's not, you, you don't absorb it through osmosis, the mathematics. 
And at one point, you have to sit down and really start uh, to get immersed and to study it, etc. And I think this part is completely uh, obliterated by this uh, fun activity. So again, and this has to do with the ritualization. But now let me come to what I find is a personal challenge um, from the report to me, because I'm standing here for the principle of excellence only. This is what the ESC represents, and I'm standing firmly behind it. So here in the report, we have excellent, and how can we combine it with relevance? And my answer to this is I want to do, I want to imitate you. And I want to do what you do in the report by distinguishing science with a capital S and science with a small s. And I want to do this with excellence and distinguish excellence with a capital E and excellence with a small e. And the same with relevance. So it's a kind of fractal response that I'm trying to offer to you. And um, excellence with a capital E, this is how the ESC was started, and this was a radical departure of the policy before, that we had one part of the seventh framework program devoted exclusively to one evaluation criteria, excellence only. And therefore, excellence with a capital E stands for a policy program. It stands for what I think and many now recognize indeed is a radical departure in policy of what ex existed before. It's Europe's response and uh, you know, I will not uh, go into the history of how the ESC uh, came about, <clears throat> but it is and it was a very courageous response to a number of problems that Europe was facing by saying, well, we fund only um, uh, research that uh, supports the competitiveness of European industry at European level, and the member states can do whatever they like, and they fund frontier research. But it was this radical change to say, no, Europe at European level, we have to take this on. So, and then there's excellence with a small e, and these are the practices. And the practices consist in doing excellent work. It's an ideal that every researcher anywhere and everywhere strives for all the time. You want to be good, otherwise what is the point? And it's also a norm that the scientific community um, holds in very high esteem. It's not just rhetoric about being an excellent researcher. This is how reputation is being established, but it also is something that researchers recognize in each other, and it is an ideal of the scientific community. And of course, as a practice, excellence with a small e is always multidimensional. You cannot uh, put it together and collapse it into one dimension only. It varies by research field, what is considered to be excellence. People recognize it in your area. This is why in the ESC we have constructed and set up the panels in a way that it's the, the community that goes by different norms and has a different culture, and that's the only community and way to judge it, but it is multidimensional. Now, in a similar way, I would argue that relevance with a capital R is what the grand challenges represent. Uh, this is as big as you can get uh, with a capital R. Very clearly, no one can say the grand challenges are not relevant. And it's a relevance that concerns humanity, so you cannot go beyond that. I mean, the way how we solve the problem of having um, 13 or 11 billion of people and feed them and house them and uh, etc. These are very, very relevant problems with a capital R. And this, of course, opens up a huge um, space that demands openness to this relevance. Uh, I think 
we would not be well advised to say it's only rhetoric or to criticize it from, from, from this point of view. It's a relevance that needs to be recognized as being of real concern. Uh, but then if you move on to relevance with the small r, if you try to break it down to much more concrete practices again, where relevance comes up, um, I would like to borrow a distinction that one of our colleagues, uh, Harry Collins, brought up with expertise. Harry Collins is a STS scholar who has been um, who has written extensively based on his experience as an embedded uh, social scientist among uh, physicists who are working on gravity waves. And he lived with this community, he worked with this community, and after a couple of years he was able to speak as though he was one of them. And uh, this expertise that he had acquired, he put it to a kind of Turing test, and uh, he passed the Turing test, so no one could recognize uh, that he was not a real uh, gravity wave physicist, but a social scientist embedded in, in that community. But he made a very important distinction, and he said, what I have achieved is interactional expertise. I can speak with people, I can exchange with them, I understand what they say, and from this point of view, it gets me so far, and it's, uh, it's, it's fun, it's interesting. But and then comes in the other distinction, I will never be able to contribute to the way how the field of gravity waves advances. This is contributing expertise, and this is a distinction that I find very useful. And I would like to use it for relevance with a small r, but I would like to add a third component in relevance as a practice. I would say, first of all, there is something that I would like to call epistemic relevance. Epistemic relevance. In what you do as a researcher, you have a sense of relevance for what you do, which is epistemic. You are interested in the research question. You want to understand the world, be it the natural world, be it the social world, how the brain works, whatever it is. And this is epistemic relevance. And you cannot do research without epistemic relevance. And then, on top of that, you can go for interactional relevance. You want to acquire enough knowledge expertise so that you can indeed exchange with others in the, in, in, in the sense of what you do, making it relevant so that others can relate to it. And then comes um, akin to what uh, Harry Collins meant with contributing expertise, there comes contributing relevance. And contributing relevance is about the short-term, long-term, intended and unintended consequences and impact of your work. And there you never know who will take it up, when it will be taken up, by whom will it be taken up, and this is part of the inherent uncertainty that comes with every research that opens into a terrain that has not been uh, explored uh, as yet. So, um, I will conclude with saying um, where this takes me and perhaps also us is where are the missing links between excellence with a capital E and excellence with a small e, in other words, with the institutional way in which excellence is being framed and uh, become institutionalized, and that's what the ESC is, it's an institutionalization of scientific excellence, and the actual practices in all their diversity, and what are the links. And there's just one example from the ESC experience that where I feel there is a missing, there's a gap. And this concerns uh, observing how the panels work, 
I see one problem in our evaluation procedure, but I'm sure it's not ESC specific, but since we are seen as sort of as the avant-garde of, of excellence, um, and this has to do with the fact that many of our panels look apart from the uh, track record and uh, the, the project, they also look at where does this person work. This is not an, a, an evaluation criteria, but you feel it is in the room, it's the elephant in the room. And if you have a mediocre person from a well-recognized institution, the way how the evaluators treat the project is different and it's biased compared to the way how the panel treats a brilliant younger researcher from an institution that they may have never heard of or where they say, you know, who can work under these circumstances in some peripheral institution of Europe. And this is just one example from my personal experience where I feel we have to look at the gap between excellence with a capital E and with a, with a small one. And similar in a way, I, I think we should explore the gaps between relevance, the way how we talked about it this morning, and the kind of relevance in an epistemic way, in an interaction way, in a contributing way. And the contribution, of course, always has this openness towards the future, because in frontier research, you do not know the outcome. You do not know which impact you will have and when and how and how it will, uh, it will work out. And there, I think something like, you know, a feeling for the, for the potential comes in, a, a feeling for something that is latently there, a potential, and again, um, I am, I'm struggling to find, you know, what could be the possible bridges. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, reflection on the report, and now I ask Paul Boyd. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I've looked through my talk, and I think it'll only take about 45 minutes. <laughs> Actually, I meant four to five minutes, so don't, don't worry too much. <laughs> I'm very conscious it's the end of a long day, and, and appreciate that you've all managed to come, and I think it's an important reason we've come. I've had a careful look at this document, of course, having been asked to speak about it, and I think it really does help us in many ways uh, to think carefully about this relationship between science and society. And I'm going to pull out a few um, points that I think are very pertinent from the report, make one or two points uh, that relate a little bit to what Helga said around the concept of excellence, and also think a little bit about um, what it is that we do as scientists in, in this procedure. First of all, I'd just like to thank ESF, of course, for producing the report and inviting me to speak here, and Ulrika, of course, for chairing, and the group of academics who came together to put this report in, in place. So first of all, um, of course, this report stresses that we need to be moving away from the idea of science and society to a, an approach which is much more science in society. And, of course, I agree with that approach. It's trying to move us beyond the assumption that we simply want to engage with society through the dissemination of our results, and we need to think much more about how science is embedded in society. Embedded seems to be an important word over the last few days. Um, the relationship, it seems to me, as the report points out, between science and society is particularly relevant at the moment. The fact that we are in a period of austerity in a period when people would talk of economic crisis, actually does have implications for the scientific endeavor. And it has many implications, but two mo most obviously. First of all, of course, science is looked to to try and help us out of crisis. So constantly governments are looking to science to provide the innovation that will bring back economic growth. But secondly, budgets are tight. So governments are looking to try and reduce the amount of money they spend on science, at least in some nations. In others, they take perhaps what we might regard as wise decisions to increase the budget on science at times of economic crisis. So it seems to me that this is a particularly important time for us to be thinking about the way that science engages 
with society, however we might define that. And it also means, as Helga and others have said, including in the report, that we're going to move into a constant period of evaluation. And by this I mean evaluation, post hoc evaluation, which is the way I would usually use the term evaluation. Trying to understand the value of the research that's been conducted. There will be increasing pressure on us to be able to demonstrate that the work we do has some value. Now, of course, we all agree as scientists that some work will have value immediately and some work won't. Some work will only be, the value of it may only be seen in the long, distant time. But even so, I think it is an important thing for us all to be thinking about as governments are thinking hard about our budgets. Just look to the United States experience. Just look to what's happening at NSF and funding for sci social sciences. There is pressure coming from uh, politicians to look carefully at what they're spending their money on, and we need to be aware of that. It also raises the rather obvious question in the report, although it doesn't dwell on it, but it clearly raises this question of the relationship between bottom-up research, what some people often call excellent uh, related research, and, and of course Helga's right, the way we use the term excellence is, is quite important to think about here, and top-down research. So research that is influenced by, uh, be it the funders, be it uh, the academic community through consultation, be it governments, whoever it might be, some influence over the sorts of topics that we see. And of course, in, in European Commission terms, we, we might contrast the ERC with a very bottom-up uh, driven approach and, and the societal challenges, which are seen to be more top-down. It seems to me crucial to accept, of course, that there's no reason at all why the work funded bottom-up is necessarily any more excellent than the work that is funded top-down. My research council funds both. We fund roughly half and half. Half the money I give out is purely bottom-up. Half the money we give out is influenced by priorities. I can guarantee that there's excellent work funded in both and there's very poor work funded in both, without question. So excellence is not tied to it being pure in the sense that academics have dreamt it up without any influence. Academics live in a society and a world. We are influenced. We do not dream up our research ideas on our own. We are influenced by things all around us. Whether that is being influenced directly by a priority that the commission or a funding agency or whoever has dreamt up, or be it just the daily lives you lead, which influence the ideas that you have that influence, therefore, the research you're conducting. So we must be careful that both can lead to very good research and poor research, in my view. We also need to think here uh, that relevance and um, excellence are, of course, crucial, particularly at this meeting. As we've already pointed out, social science and humanities are vital to some of the most important questions. Helga and many other researchers will draw our attention to the role of social sciences and humanities in innovation. Governments are crucially interested in innovation, and we have a major role to play. We know the importance of social innovation. We know it's not just about technological innovation. We know that 70% of our economy is a service sector and not all about manufacturing. We know that linear models of innovation don't work or are really outdated ways of viewing the innovation cycle, which is much more realistic. We also know that research is not what happens at the beginning of innovation and stops, but it happens throughout the innovation process. We know all of this from social science research. We also know that not all innovation is good and that innovation can be very poor. Indeed, there was a very useful ESF uh, document from the social sciences group that points that out very carefully. Innovation is not necessarily a good thing. Think about all the wonderful innovations in the banking sector <laughs> that led to a massive collapse. The next point I want to make, and, and this leads on to my point about excellence versus, or the sort of bottom-up versus top-down. One of the things we're increasingly doing at my funding agency is encouraging the co-production of knowledge. We're encouraging academics to engage with people outside of academia as they develop their ideas. It's not because we think this in any way taints the process of research, it's simply that we think it will lead to better research. It doesn't have to, in the end, be collaborative, but we do believe that academics talking to other organisations outside of academia, be they in the third sector, the private sector, the, the government, wherever it might be, will help shape their ideas will help them think differently about their research. And that sort of co-discussion, which can lead to co-production, I think is a really valuable thing for us to be thinking about. We learn from our daily experiences 
Why not use that experience more actively as we develop our research projects, at least in some of what we do? And we have schemes at My Research Council where you're not eligible to apply unless you're going to be applying alongside another organisation. And that's some of our top-down sort of focused approaches. In our bottom-up, we leave it entirely to the academics. So I think there's a role for both, and there's value that can come from both. We must accept, of course, that none of this is predictable. It's very hard to know where the best ideas will come from, or the best innovations, or the best science. We have to do our best to provide an environment that's flexible and that allows for these different ideas to come together. And that brings me back to the point of the whole point of this document, which is science and society. And I want to end on that one point, because it seems to me that if we accept that to some degree engaging with others in the way that we develop our research, because I honestly believe that's what we do already, then you could argue that, yes, I fundamentally agree with the approach that we should move from science and society to science in society, but you could also argue that we should be striving for society in science, trying to make sure that we acknowledge the way that society really does influence what we do. I don't think there's any science that isn't to some degree influenced by the, the perspectives you get from being in a scientific world. So, uh, I'll finish. I said I would only speak for a few minutes. Um, what next? It seems to me this report lays down a whole series of really interesting points. It has some recommendations, which I think we need to take seriously. I think possibly we need to think beyond that to what the practical steps will be. What does it mean for the way that funding agencies are going to change what they do? And I suppose the obvious place to look is Science Europe, as we set up our working groups and, and scientific committees to take on board the messages we're getting from this research and think about how we use the lessons from this piece of work to inform what we all agree is a vital part of the work that we do, making sure that society values what we do. And we really need to make sure that we do achieve that. Thank you very much. We will have no questions and no discussion. It's very late. I encourage you if you have, unless there is a need for this, but my suggestion is that if you have questions or comments, you uh, talk to speakers and to other authors of the report during the drinks. But let me take now a minute, first of all, to thank the speakers for this very late performance, wonderful performance. Thank you very much. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all authors of uh, the science policy briefing, the whole group, uh, for their hard work over more than one year, especially Ulrike, who led it in a wonderful way and working with whom is a real pleasure. Thanks a lot. And uh, last but not least, I would like to thank organizers for uh, giving us this opportunity to bring this report to this conference, which I think is uh, the right place to inform about it. Thank you again. Thank you.